Uh, our presenter today is Gloria La Riva, who will be talking about Cuba's revolutionary history and the current situation. Gloria is a founding member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation and a longtime leader in the Cuba Solidarity Movement. She is coordinator of the National Committee to Free the Cuban Five and has traveled many times to Cuba and written on Cuba's economic and political developments. Please welcome Gloria. When we talk about Cuba's revolutionary history, it didn't just begin on January 1st, 1959, when the dictator Fulgencio Batista was overthrown by the revolutionary forces led by Fidel Castro. In fact, Cuba's history of rebellion and struggle for justice has existed for literally hundreds of years, beginning with the um, great indigenous leader Hatue, who actually came from what is now the Dominican Republic uh, when the colonial Spanish colonizers were brutalizing the indigenous people on the different islands. Atue brought several hundred people from uh, his Hispaniola to Cuba to warn people that they had to fight back against the Spaniards. He was caught and just before he was burned at the stake, um, the priest said to him, do you repent so that you can go to heaven before he was to be executed? And he said, are people like you going to be there? And he's, they said, of course. He said, then I don't want to go there, and I don't repent. Um, Atue is a great symbol in Cuba of resistance to oppression. But in addition, um, after centuries of Spanish colonialism, a new Cuban nation had arisen, uh, led by the new growing capitalist class of Cuba. And the first independence war was actually 1868, which lasted for 10 years. And it was uh, led and begun by the Grito de Yara, which was the great, um, they call him the father of the nation, Manuel, um, Carlos Manuel de Céspedes. And in declaring the new uh, war for independence from Spain, he also called on other plantation owners to free the slaves because slavery still existed in Cuba until 1886. That war lasted 10 years. Uh, then the Second Independence War began in 1895, inspired by the formation of the Cuban Revolutionary Party by the great Latin American hero and Cuban hero, Jose Martí. Uh, Jose Martí and Antonio Maceo, the, one of the greatest generals he and Maximo Gomez, Calixto Garcia, they led the independence war, the second war against Spanish colonialism. That began in 1895. The Cuban masses were united. Um, the Spaniards sent in 300,000 troops to try to defeat the Cuban uh, machete fighters, the mambisas as they're known. And in 1898, as the Spaniards were suffering enormous losses and great defeat on the verge of victory of the Cubans. An interesting incident happened in the harbor of Havana, and that was the explosion of the USS Maine. This was a US ship that was in the harbor that had been sent in by the US government, and 270 soldiers died, sailors died. The US used that as an excuse, much like the Gulf of Tonkin years later, against Spain and declared war on Spain. And uh, in other words, this was the victory, the impending victory of independence by the Cuban revolutionaries that was thwarted by US intervention. Uh, the US took hold of Cuba, Spain, Puerto Rico, and Guam. And in a particularly ignominious insult to the Cuban people, as Spain ceded control of these uh, properties and its ownership of the island of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Guam, and the Philippines, the Cuban revolutionaries were kept out of Santiago de Cuba when Spain signed the surrender agreement with the US. So from 1898 until 1902 was outright US colonial control uh, there was a U.S. governor that ruled there, and the U.S. only left, and they were forced to leave really because there was such a widespread, deep, profound sense of uh, anger at the uh, 
independence that was taken away from Cuba. And the US finally left in 1902, formally, the Marines left. But only after the US crafted the new constitution of Cuba and forced, uh, despite great opposition, forced the Cuban uh, leaders to accept what is called the Platt Amendment. And this was an amendment attached to the Cuban constitution that said the US could establish coaling stations. These were uh, military stations wherever they pleased in Cuba. That is where the US control to this day of Guantanamo began. The Guantanamo Naval Base is from that. And the, it also included the right of the US to intervene in Cuba whenever they wished. Uh, until 1912, the US Marines intervened in Cuba four times. So this was not real independence from 1902, when the Marines left, till 1934, uh, the Platt Amendment meant that Cuba was really not independent. And it was always this threat hanging over the Cuban people that if they ever uh, fought against US ownership or against, you know, carried out strikes that threatened US properties, the US could come in at any time. Then finally, in 1933, 1934, there was a huge revolutionary uprising. And it forced the overthrow of the dictator Gerardo Machado, who was behind the scenes was none other than uh, Fulgencio Batista, who was a sergeant at the time. That was known as the rebellion of the sergeants, which he led. And for many years, Batista was behind the scenes while puppet presidents um, were nominally the leaders. If Fulgencio Batista was president from 1940 to 1944, and then the, bringing it to the modern era, era of Cuban history, he left Cuba for a while, and in 1952, elections were taking place, national elections. Fulgencio Batista came back to Cuba to run for president. When it became clear that he was going to lose in a, by a strong margin, he actually carried out this infamous coup, March 10, 1952. And the Constitution was thrown out. The Congress was abolished. It was martial law. It was a very repressive time. And interestingly, after he declared this martial law and the military came in under his command to repress all forms of, of uh, protest, opposition, to rule with an iron hand, Fidel Castro, this young leader, went into court to order that he be arrested, that Batista be charged with violating the Constitution and the popular, um, the rights of the people. Um, that was clear that there were no legal means to bring about democracy in Cuba. So he began secretly, Fidel, to organize a resistance movement. And the first open act of that resistance movement was some 15 months later, on July 26, which is today, a national, the, the main national holiday in Cuba, uh, July 26, 1953, the early pre-dawn hours. Fidel, his brother Raul, and other young men, workers, um, peasants who had planned for months, they went to try to attack and take over the Moncada military barracks in Santiago de Cuba, which is in the far eastern part of the island. Yeah. It was defeated within hours of the military attack on the base. A number of them escaped, including Fidel and Raul and others, and they were arrested. Uh, this act of the attack on the Moncada barracks, even though it was a huge defeat and many people were killed, it became the clarion call for the Cuban people. And that's why today it's such a holiday, because it resulted in the overthrow of Batista several, five years later, and in the victory of the Socialist Revolution. But imagine, this was a defeat. The, the survivors are arrested. In October, Fidel and Raul and his uh, comrades are put on trial. And in what became a historic speech called History Will Absolve Me, he spoke for four hours at the end of his conviction. And he explained in these four hours the reason for their rebellion. He said, I am the author of this. I am responsible for it. And I, we do not repent because of the hundreds of thousands of farm workers, the sugar cane cutters who starve 
after working only four months of the year in the harvest, of the children who have parasites in their bellies, of the people who starve, of the political repression. This is why we're fighting. And that, in his time of imprisonment, uh, became a little booklet that was distributed through the island. And people began to look at these young men and women as leaders of a new future. Uh, after 15 months of imprisonment, in which the prison became a real school for these revolutionaries in studying Marxism and other history, their own history, and finding out, you know, organizing within the prison for how to continue this struggle for justice. They were freed by an amnesty, actually, by Batista, because of the mass popular pressure to free them from prison. After their uh, freedom, in 1955, Fidel realizes they face possible assassination. Under the years of 1952, from the time that uh, Batista declared the coup until January 1959, 20,000 people were massacred by the Batista forces, by the army, the police, torturers. This infamous BRAC, which was the Bureau of Anti-Communist Repression, that's what the name of it was, they would take young people from the universities. Anybody who had revolutionary literature would be just summarily executed. People gunned down in the streets. Young people ambushed. The uh, remaining rebel uh, forces, led by Fidel and Raul, escaped to Mexico. And in a short number of months in Mexico, that is where he met the great revolutionary leader Che Guevara. They were united for the remainder of um, Che's life. And they trained. They came back on the great Granma boat. It's called a yacht, but it's not really a yacht. It was a little kind of rickety boat that carried 82 men. And those 82 men landed on December 2nd after a very stormy trip from Mexico to, to the Cuban shores, landed in um, Cuba on December 2nd. 1956, and almost immediately they were bombed by the Batista Air Force. They were almost all killed again. Dozens of them were killed by the bombing and the repression, and a handful of them survived. A handful of them survived. When they found each other in the woods, Fidel asked his brother, how many weapons do we have? Raul said, we have seven pistols, guns, rifles. He said, good, we can start the revolution. And it was that spirit of determination and confidence in the masses, understanding the economic conditions, the political conditions, the, the, all the conditions that were ripe for revolution but that needed a decisive action was what this combination of the leadership and the, and the desire by the people for real change which allowed for the victory of the Cuban Revolution. So on, after these um, roughly two years of battle in the mountains of the Sierra Maestra, um, everywhere the rebels went and engaged in military combat, this is an important thing to know about how the Cuban military, the police, the forces inside of Cuba, the state, how they conduct themselves with regard to the law and the respect for people's rights. It's important to know that the rebel army uh, had a policy and a culture of never abusing prisoners of war, and they let the soldiers go home free. And that's why they had the, the support of the people. The army of Batista was just losing. They were very demoralized, and that's why the victory was so decisive. January 1st, in the 3 a.m., Batista boards a plane with some of his henchmen, and flew away, and that is considered really the dawn of the Cuban Revolution. Um, the, the capitalist state of repression, the police, the army, it virtually disappeared. It just dissolved before the massive support of the people for the rebel army. The rebel army became, for a time, in the first months and years, the rebel army really became the enforcer of the revolution. It was the new embryonic state before it became institutionalized with the 
with the military, with the police, with the constitution, with the government, and so on. So the first decrees uh, were very popular. Um, within weeks of the revolution, the revolutionary triumph, rents and cost of medicine were cut in half. Now, how is that possible when you had this, this capitalist class still existing? Well, first of all, you had the rebel army that enforced it, but the people were for it. The most of the people were poor. Most of the people were tenants. Most of the people had no ability, no access to medicines, and so on. And then in May, within five months of the revolution, it became a sweeping land reform law in which all the U.S. properties were confiscated, more than two million acres by five major U.S. companies, including sugar growers. Um, education was implemented. Thousands of classrooms were built. The first two years of the revolution were very, very decisive measures, always backed by the people. Within months, through different laws and acts, all U.S. property, the railroads, the sugar mills, sugar plantations, the banks, the mines, Cuba was a big mining country, were all expropriated and placed in the hands of the people. Uh, this created uh, great and greater access to people for the ability to, to have more food, to have medicine, to have education, to have housing. The, urban, the first urban reform law of October 1960 prohibited the landlords from being landlords anymore. And people were now able to truly have housing. It wasn't because the banks became generous and gave people loans. It's because landlordism was abolished. The US, as you can imagine, losing its property, losing its control over this island, and really fearing the danger of uh, inspiring other revolutions in Latin America, began an immediate aggression against Cuba. In March 1960, the Eisenhower administration uh, crafted what was called the policy for the destabilization of the, of, for the overthrow of the Castro regime, as they entitled it. And what it involved was an unfolding U.S. blockade, which exists to this day, and terrorist activity that even Eisenhower said, we have to make it so secret to be able to deny that it even existed. And so this policy of blockade became formal in 1962. Despite the fact that trade with uh, the United States was prohibited, later it was banned for Americans to travel to Cuba. To this day, there's still a travel ban. Uh, while Cuba now allows free travel for its citizens, uh, it's the United States that prevents us from going to Cuba freely so that we can see the reality of the Cuban Revolution f with our own eyes. But um, the U.S. began what later became the Bay of Pigs invasion, which took place in April 1961. And that was several months of the U.S. bringing in these former torturers of the Batista regime, um, former property owners who lost property. They were trained in Guatemala and Honduras. And in April 61, uh, some 2,000 mercenaries tried to land at the Bay of Pigs in the southern part of Cuba. They were defeated within 72 hours, and it's labeled as the first victory over U.S. imperialism was the defeat at the Bay of Pigs. It was because of the mass support of the people for the revolution. Right before the U.S. invaded, this U.S. proxy war invasion, um, just the day before, the Cuban airport was bombed by U.S. planes that were painted to make it seem like they were Cuban. And a number of civilians were killed. And in that funeral cortege, after they were buried, after these martyrs were buried in the cemetery, this tens of thousands of people followed the car that Fidel was in after the funeral. And he stopped at this intersection in Havana and gave us a very memorable speech in which he said, we're facing U.S. invasion. We've been fighting you know, for a, a revolution that really meets the needs of the people. And he said, it's time that we really make clear what it is we're fighting for. We're fighting for a socialist revolution. This is socialism we're fighting for. And he said, paraphrasing his speech, he said, what bothers the U.S. imperialism so much 
is that we have a socialist revolution right under their noses, 90 miles away. This is the kind of inspiration that has kept the Cuban revolution going. The confidence in the people, always informing the people, always having the masses involved in every decision. Uh, but the U.S. didn't stop there with the military attacks. What we know in the U.S. as the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it's known in Cuba, they call it the October, uh, the Crisis of October, was actually precipitated by a massive U.S. invasion plan called Operation Mongoose. Operation Mongoose was going to include the massive carpet bombing of the whole island of Cuba. And in 1960, Two, in September, October, U.S. spy planes were flying over Cuba and discovered uh, what later was known as the setting up of nuclear tactical missiles. The Soviet Union, knowing, along with Cuba, that Cuba was about to be carpet bombed, offered Cuba tactical nuclear weapons, and Cuba accepted. And that became known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. We were told by the U.S. media and the U.S. government that Cuba was going to bomb the U.S., that there was going to be a nuclear war. It actually came very close to a possible nuclear confrontation between the Soviet Union and Cuba. And the way it ended up being resolved after a tense two weeks was that the Soviet Union agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba if the U.S. would remove the missiles that were pointed against the Soviet Union that were based in Turkey, and if the U.S. would promise not to invade Cuba again. So that promise, even though U.S. aggression never stopped, that promise to not to invade Cuba remained as long as the Soviet Union remained. Um, but the Cuban Revolution in the meantime, in the, the year of the Bay of Pigs invasion, for the first time in the whole hemisphere, illiteracy was wiped out because 100,000 volunteers, mainly young people, young teenagers, went to the countryside in this national program to educate the people and wipe out illiteracy through the teaching every person in the country, in the, in the cities who didn't know how to read. These were some of the great advances. Um, Health care was made free. Today, almost everybody in Cuba owns a home, and those who rent can only pay 10% of their income of one person in the household. Today, there are tens of thousands of young people who have become trained as medical doctors. So that's a little bit about the Cuban Revolution. Uh, I would like to say a little bit about the U.S. blockade. The U.S. blockade is extremely destructive. It, it, it all, not only involves a ban, of any U.S. trade with Cuba, but it, it, in fact it has an extraterritorial application. The blockade has caused damage to Cuba's economy and population to the tune of more than $1.157 trillion. What does it mean in human terms? It means that many very specific specialized medicines, for example, that are needed for children's cancer treatment, you know, not every country can produce those kinds of medicines. The U.S. either controls them and bans the sale of them or forces other countries not to sell them to Cuba. Uh, recently, the government of Tanzania was building a factory, a plant, to produce medicines to help prevent the spread of malaria. And here, Tanzania was going to build this plant with Cuba's assistance and a U.S. bank, under order of this blockade, the U.S. government blockade, confiscated all that money that Cuba was helping to provide for the building of this plan. So the, so the blockade is truly genocidal. It's directed most, uh, mostly against the Cuban people, but it affects people around the world, actually, when Cuba tries to give its assistance. It costs extra money for Cuba to buy food from halfway around the world. It's a very severe, severe blockade. And one of our mis biggest objectives, and should be, of anybody who uh, supports Cuba's independence, supports Cuba's revolution, and just supports Cuba's right to live, should be firmly opposed to this U.S. blockade. In fact, the world opposes a blockade. Every year, the 
UN General Assembly vote on the question of whether the US blockade should be lifted. And it says the US, well, they call it the embargo, but we call it the US blockade. The numbers of countries against it grows and grows. In the fall of 2013, the vote was 187 countries for lifting the blockade, and only two countries supported it. Only two countries voted in support. Who were they? The US and Israel. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty damning number that the whole world. But as we know, the General Assembly really has no enforcement power. The, U, the real enforcement power comes from the Security Council, which the US dominates. The Soviet Union, and for a time, China had very, very strong relations with Cuba. Eastern Europe, uh, the strongest political and economic partner was the Soviet Union. And Cuba's imports, 85% of Cuba's imports came from the socialist camp. Eastern Europe, but primarily the Soviet Union. Petroleum, tractors, cars, um, you know, anything that involved high technology or industrial production. It was a very, very important relationship. All of Cuba's military hardware, planes, their military um, was supported for free from the Soviet Union. But then, as we know, the Soviet Union, the revolution was overthrown in 1991. But just before that, under Gorbachev and Yeltsin, they acceded to US pressure. And almost overnight, in 1990 and 1991, all the contracts that Cuba had with the Soviet Union for this 85% of imports was cut off. And Cuba faced an enormous economic crisis. And what Cuba brought forth was called the special period. And basically what it involved was Cuba having to come up with alternative sources of income and trading partners to survive this enormous economic blow. So what they did was uh, the, the, the mass organizations, the Communist Party of Cuba, the whole people of Cuba engaged in this fight for their survival, which was necessary. How to come up with new sources of income. A very strategic move to basically defend and preserve and keep the socialist gains, free health care, free education, the housing, everything that the Cubans needed, you know, the basic needs of the people, to preserve those, they had to, in their very honest and objective description was, we have to institute some capitalist style reforms to defend the socialist revolution. They involved foreign investment in Cuba's uh, economy, which allowed for foreign companies to come in and invest. Uh, Usually it was 49% ownership of the profits. They could repatriate the profits out of the country. And also uh, the tourism industry. Tourism is now number one as a result of the special period measures because Cuba has great beaches. They have a beautiful island, a very peaceful society. And it was something that they could take advantage of to bring in hard currency. The other was. Um, allowing people to possess US dollars for many, many years. Uh, Cubans could not have hard currency like US dollars in order to help control the limited amount of currency that they had. That was now allowed. And that way, mainly the Cubans who live abroad and still had family in Cuba could send money there. It was a whole measure. Now, it was a very hard time, if you can imagine. From 1989 to 1993, Cuba's production dropped by almost 35%, 34.5%. That meant factories seized up. It was a very, very hard time. It was really a matter of enormous sacrifice by the whole Cuban population. That's why I always consider that the, the people of Cuba are truly heroes, not just for volunteering to go fight in Angola or going to places like to help the African revolutions, or going to places where they risk their lives in, in very remote areas to provide medical care. They were heroic for defending their, their socialist revolution.
for standing up to U.S. pressures and the blockade when they seem to be totally alone. And as a result of all these measures and the very hard work of the people, and also growing alliances with countries that refused to abide by the blockade, they began to recover in the decade of 2000. Uh, the recovery began in 1996, a very slow recovery, but by 2000, there was 10%, 11%, 9% annual growth. The, company, the country was coming out of this economic crisis, but all the time it had the cohesive support of the masses for the revolution and for the party. Then came uh, the 2008 financial debacle in the United States, thanks to the U.S. banks, and which had a worldwide effect, and it affected Cuba as well. So in the last several years, the Cuban party, the, the trade unions, all the mass organizations, the women's organization, the Young Communist Union, all the mass organizations have been engaged in a national debate, discussions, the workplaces, the schools, the whole population has been involved in formal debates on how to overcome the crisis that capitalism is undergoing, but which also affects Cuba. The, the rise in food prices, the continual U.S. blockade. But in the past few years, there's been a resumption and an increase in the measures, these economic measures that were instituted during the special period. And so there's been some major changes in Cuba. Uh, you know, Fidel became seriously ill. He almost died in 2006. He was gravely ill for a number of years, starting in 2006. And he has recovered, but he's no longer the president. He retired. Now Raul Castro is the current president. And they, uh, starting in, in 2010 mainly, there have been these formal discussions, the, the party congress, the, the sixth party congress, what is uh, called the whole new uh, guidelines for these changes. Now, um, there has been a great encouragement in self-employment. There's been self-employment since the 90s, but now the self-employment has been greatly expanded. Licenses are being granted just for asking for people to be able to have their small businesses, either self-employment to become, let's say, a plumber, helping in home construction or home repair, all kinds of things, opening up little restaurants, being able to sell pizza or you know, small uh, food establishments. And they also the decentralizing of social services or services like uh, barbershops, taxi services, many, many things are being, um, are undergoing changes that are no longer under state operation. The properties are still owned by the state. It's still socialist property. But for example, in a barbershop or a beauty parlor or in a taxi service, the workers are now the owners of their production. They run the place, they, but now they pay the rent they take care of uh, purchasing the items that are needed, and they also pay taxes. What this is meant to do is to help stimulate the economy. There's a great need for stimulating the economy, and this is allowing the state to eliminate um, perhaps up to a million uh, jobs in the state sector. The, the state can no longer provide for all of this state employment without seriously affecting the ability of the country to provide health care, education, free education. The country has to be able to provide these basic needs, uh, and if they were to continue employment in some of these entities that is uh, a heavy drain on the economy, it would affect the, the basic rights that people have of education and health care. It's a lot to go into about Cuba's economy today, but the aim of all these changes is to help defend, maintain, and to grow the Cuban Revolution. There's been such great, great, great development in that country. So the Cuban Revolution gives us the encouragement and the knowledge that socialist revolution is the only answer.
we have a couple of questions for Gloria. Uh, we hear a lot that uh, Cuba is not democratic. Can you address that? And the second question is, a lot of people say that there is no freedom of speech in Cuba, they can't, uh, that you can't speak out against the government. Is this true? When we talk about democracy, it's really a very abstract term with no real meaning unless we put it in a class context. Is it democracy for the rich or for the poor, for the working class? Cuba is a workers' democracy in which the rule, the, the, the democratic rule of the capitalists, that is the, the power of the landlord over the tenant, of the corporation over the worker, that was abolished. And what was put in place instead was it's a worker's power. Um, the capitalist class has been eliminated and all the property is in the hands of the people. It's a socialist revolution. So that is the most democratic thing. The fact that all the guarantees of life are there for the people, the health care, the education. It's a basic elemental right. So a parent doesn't have to worry whether their child will have a doctor or if they will have a doctor or their kid can go to school. That's the essence of of a worker's democracy. But in addition, um, a worker doesn't have to worry about being fired because the profits aren't high enough. Any economic decisions are made collectively by the whole society. As far as the uh, political institutions of Cuba, Cuba not only has elections, some people think that Cuba doesn't have uh, political um, entities, but in fact they have elections for the National Assembly, the Provincial Assembly, and the Municipal Assembly at the ground level. Uh, everyone from the age of 16 can vote in Cuba, so the youth have a real role in the elections. And campaigning, uh, the way we understand it in the United States, where to become a senator you need millions of dollars, that is um, prohibited in Cuba. And candidates don't run on the basis of elect me and I'll promise you these things, or elect me and then I'll have a career in politics that will make me rich. The, the people who become part of the municipal, provincial, or national assembly, they keep their jobs. They're workers. They still are involved in, in whatever livelihood that they had before. They're simply the representatives of either their neighborhood or their province or the country. And electioneering is really prohibited. There is no spending of money by candidates in the election. So that makes it truly free and much more democratic. I like to say that not only is there free speech in Cuba, it's an, opin it's a, it's a, it's an opinion that people have that's educated. The people are highly educated about how their economy is working, the workings of the country, um, from top to bottom, bottom to top. And so then the opinions that they have, the, uh, the expressions of free speech are far more informed. And the, if you look at the United States or a ca any other capitalist country, the people were told that the country had to go to war against Iraq and, d and devastate that country because of weapons of mass destruction. That was an outright lie. So we may think that we have free speech, but in fact we don't. We don't have any access to the media. And in Cuba, the media of Cuba is intended to inform. They don't have sensationalist news. You won't find reality shows on television to just divert our attention from the real things at hand in Cuba. You have informed education, entertainment, that's healthy in Cuba on their TV stations. You have a plethora of radio that's accessible to the people. And the, the message of the media is to defend the interests of the masses, to defend the socialist interests. That's why when you go to Cuba, the, the, the children know more about the United States than we do ourselves. They know more about the world and what's taking place, and they know what's right and just. Um, I remember one time in the 1990s, in the very, very difficult part of the special period, we organized a group of children from ages 10 to 18 to Cuba, and our, our kids went to a school 
And it was obvious that children didn't have um, new shoes. It was the special period. The resources were very, very limited. And so their shoes were old, and they weren't the newest like the kids had in the US. And the children of the United States asked them, one child said, if you could wish for one thing in the world, what would you want? And the, the children in Cuba, these school kids, raised their hand. And one child said, I want to see the end of racism in the world. And another said, I want, to, I want to be an astronaut for my country. And another child said, I want peace in the world. They didn't ask of anything for themselves. And I really think that was such an honest and telling and unexpected answer from these kids to US children, and really is why uh, the US prohibits us from going there under penalty of imprisonment or massive fines so that we can see the Cuban Revolution for ourselves and give us inspiration for our own struggles at home.